Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our latest webinar, which is uh, on the subject of entrance control, that line of uh, security, security barriers that you find at the front of many a building. So we're going to start by outlining what this morning is about and what we're going to be doing um, and how it all works. And to start off with some introductions. Uh, hi, I'm Kevin. I'm the sales account manager for the South of England. And I'm joined in presentation duties this morning by Barney, who is the sales account manager for uh, the rest of the UK and Ireland. We're also joined by Daisy, whose role is, is to look after yourselves. So she'll be monitoring uh, communications from you. So to that end, uh, those of you that are new to, to Zoom webinars, you should find a Zoom tool, which allows you to, to raise your hand, to chat uh, and to post questions. Uh, we're not hung up on the need to, to raise your hand, but we, we really do encourage you to, to get involved in the chat and, and to ask as many questions as you like. Daisy will, will be looking out for those questions and she may post them in, uh, interrupting the, the presentation of the webinar if appropriate. And we do have a Q&A session at the end as well and, and some questions will be saved for that. Do note that we are uh, recording the, the webinar and, and it is gonna go onto our YouTube channel so um, if you do post questions, your name and your question may appear uh, in the recording. Uh, and as yourselves, uh, so at the last time of looking, which was, was quite recently, there was 33 people registered for uh, this webinar. Um, the, the invitations went out to our uh, Sentry uh, users, our, our mailing list, um, and uh, some other people that we've sort of manually invited. Um, and as I say, 33 people register, and I, I see that many of you had actually joined by 11 o'clock, and, and we're really delighted with the support that, uh, that you give these events, so, so welcome to you. And we have a couple of uh, special guests this morning. We have a couple of people from uh, Barrier Manufacturer IDL. They're our uh, barrier of, of choice uh, in, in recent years for a number of reasons, um, and they're here if, if we get any particularly difficult questions, um, and also I'm sure they'll, they'll get involved in the chat, so you'll see their names pop up. So welcome uh, Phil and, and John as well. So to move on to the plan for this morning, um, what we're going to look in terms of, of, what we're going to look at in terms of the subject is uh, to start by considering why you would adopt entrance control in the first place. Um, now, many of you, of course, as I've mentioned, are, are already uh, access control users. Um, but it is an obvious place to start uh, and it'll serve as a bit of a recap. Uh, we then look at why you might refresh entrance control uh, if you already have it. And once we've decided that we're going to be uh, looking at uh, entrance control, uh, then we have some considerations, we have some things to think about and we split them this morning in, into two key areas. So we have the lane design itself, which is all about what type of barrier are you, are you going to have? Uh, how many lanes do you need? Uh, and what is the, the layout uh, of the lanes uh, going to be? And then we zoom out from there uh, and we look more at a system level where we look at the perspective of, of the access control system user uh, and of the building uh, and of other systems within the, the institution. And at the end, we've got a, as I mentioned, we've got a Q&A session um, where, where we're inviting questions and, and hopefully uh, any other comments that you have. So uh, moving straight on into the first of these, then why adopt entrance control uh, in the first place? Well, what we're doing with entrance control, of course, is we're creating a, a more secure area within the building. Um, and we're doing that by providing a, a very physical and very visible uh, deterrent and, and the prevention of, of progress. So if this is uh, perhaps the front of house, we can see that we've got a, a revolving door and that's perhaps arguably providing a, a little bit of security in the first instance. And we've got a reception desk, which is staffed. So again, uh, there's a, perhaps a little bit of security taking place here. But what we were talking about with entrance control is providing a line of barriers which is going to physically prevent you from getting further. And it, it separates the building into a secure side uh, and a less secure side. 
uh, which in this instance, we've, we've got a public side, but of course it doesn't have to be. It could be, for example, in, here in our building, we might have a further line of barriers, uh, which creates a more secure area still beyond it. Um, so, so that's always right. an example of that might be a, a access controlled staff door inside uh, a barrier controlled library. So what the entrance control system is doing is it's protecting people, it's protecting library staff, it's protecting uh, library visitors, uh, it's protecting property, both uh, library property and, and personal property, and it's protecting information by way of uh, personal data, for example, and, and network access and that type of thing. And essentially how it does is it, it how it does it is it controls who can go beyond the barriers, of course. It can control who can access the building. Um, so you will be authenticating yourself at the barriers, and if you're not allowed through, then, then you don't get through, just to, to state the obvious. And while we're doing that, while we are um, authenticating every single person uh, at every single entrance attempt, there is another benefit accruing at that point. And that is that we are gathering uh, great information. So we know who your visitors are. We know your visitors down to an individual level. Uh, we know the visitors in a, in a group or, or cohort level. So we can see the different categories of people who are, who are using the facilities and, and how they're using the facility differently. And we know the total number of visitors. So we can uh, identify the occupancy of the building, for example. We can identify uh, perhaps whether, whether the library is opening at the right time in the morning, whether it's closing at the right time in the evening. We can identify uh, how Monday compares with Friday. Uh, and obviously you can use that to help ensure that your, your staffing levels are correct and then your provision of services is, is correct as well. So there are really the, these two core reasons for access control. There is the security side and there is the information side. And it's, it's not even necessarily a case of a primary and a secondary here. We do have customers who, who are certainly less concerned about the security and far more concerned about uh, getting management information in terms of, of building usage. Uh, and that is the reason why they've adopted uh, Sentry. And there's one further point to make, and that is that the entrance control system uh, is a first impression uh, for a visitor of the, of the organization or of the building or, or the department. So that first impression reflects how modern and, and professional the institution is. A visitor can see that, uh, that the uh, institution is taking their safety and their security seriously. Uh, and a visitor who, who's unauthorized uh, to, to get into the building can clearly see that, that they are not welcome uh, and they can perhaps try their luck somewhere else. So this, this final point here actually is relevant to both um, considering entrance control in the first instance and also considering uh, a refresh of entrance control. So with a view to taking this through why you might uh, refresh your entrance control system. I'm going to hand the baton over to uh, Barney to take you through the middle part of the webinar. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. So, morning, everyone. Yeah, so benefits of new design. And as Kevin said, this is, this is relevant, of course, to those of you who may already have barriers and might be thinking about refreshing or updating um, the, the area um, but it's also of course relevant to, to those of you who might be looking at access control or entrance control for the first time. So the, uh, the first benefit and perhaps the most apparent or most obvious would be um, modern aesthetics, the look and feel of the barrier. Um, the current design language features uh, heavy use of glass um, and uh, generally stainless steel um, but glass primarily to um, hopefully help balance the impression of security whilst also maintaining an open and airy feel to the building and um, so that the security doesn't feel perhaps too, too oppressive and, and, and not welcoming. Build quality over the, um, the past few years has, has, has improved through the use of um, 
improved material quality, uh, different finish options, and production techniques and, and technology means that the, the, the finished article is, is of a very, very high quality. And throughout the, um, the life cycle of, a, uh, of the barriers, then um, there's constant development going on um, in, in the background. So um, barriers in the past have, have featured sensors and they still do now. Um, but development means that the, the intelligence of these sensors is, is hugely advanced now. So the sensors um, provide a couple of uh, benefits. One of which um, is safety, so it's ensuring that the users of the lanes are, are kept safe whilst they're whilst they're passing through, and um, but also it's it's accuracy of data collection, so ensuring that um, each person that passes through the barrier is accurately recorded, so we know exactly how many people are, are in the building or, or or have exited the building at, at any one time. New barriers are very very quiet, indeed they're they're almost silent in operation. Uh, this is down to um, the use of um, direct and belt drive DC motors, which is uh, a modernization and a replacement for, for previous models that, that might have used shaft uh, driven motors and, and cam driven um, operations. So near silent operation, which is obviously important for uh, for libraries in particular, where you might expect them to, uh, to be a generally quieter environment. And the new barriers are, are also very, very efficient. So they make use of um, uh, low uh, power uh, DC uh, electronics, um, and they also feature low power modes for sort of standby, uh, standby modes, that sort of thing. So, so very, very efficient. And then some new features for, for new designs are, are additional alarms that make use of the um, in intelligence that's, that's been further developed. So um, advanced tailgating, so really um, making sure that the, the alarms are accurate and also other misuse alarms. So for instance, if someone's attempting to, to force the barrier or even uh, crawl under the barrier or even um, attempting to, to scale the barrier, then, then there's, there's various audible and, and visual alerts um, to, to to uh, make this clear to, to the, the offender and also to staff in, in, the, in the area that, that someone is misusing the system. And finally, there's, uh, there's also options or, or the possibilities to integrate with, with other building systems. So for instance, this might be CCTV. Um, and this might be important to those of you who are perhaps um, looking to offer 24 seven or out of hours opening where perhaps the, the area might be um, unstaffed. Um, and then there's other options as well for perhaps linking to, uh, to your book security system. So we'll touch on some more of these in, in a little while. So moving on to um, so, uh, some thoughts when, when looking to adopt um, new, new barriers uh, and the design therefore of the, of the lane and, and the area and, and, and some things you might need to think about um, when looking at this. So there are a number of uh, different barriers available, um, different barrier types and how they look and how they operate. And each of these um, will have a, a slightly different benefit and would perhaps suit uh, each environment or, or what your, your particular environment and your aims uh, differently. Um, so we'll look at these shortly. Um, a, a consideration here would be what sort of, what level of security do you need to offer? So the, the standard height of barriers would be um, sort of waist height, um, approximately a metre um, off the floor. Um, but there are also options for, um, for higher barriers, right up to 1.8 metres, if, if you're really needing to, to offer a, a very secure area. And this can then also be paired with a solid lock option. So as standard, the barriers have a friction break on them, which does take considerable force to, to move, but it will eventually allow allow entry through um, when somebody has really, really put their weight into it. If, if this is um, not secure enough, then there is a solid lock option that will absolutely deny entry. And then the level of security obviously also needs to be ba balanced with the aesthetic appearance and um, the, uh, what sort of aesthetic um, approach you're, you're looking to take with your entrance. So um, do you uh, actually prefer a more open and airy feel um, and a more welcoming um, appeal and this needs to therefore be balanced with the, the level of security that you're you're adopting with the barrier 
So let's take a look at, um, here we'll look at three of the different barrier types that are available. There are some others, but we'll, we'll take a look here. So we have, uh, we have retracting or swing or optical. Here we're looking at a retracting barrier. So this is the IDL fast lane glass wing. You can see here the lane is obstructed by uh, some glass wings here, one in each cabinet. And when uh, a user has authorized or authenticated themselves, the wing retracts into the body of the turnstile. Um, and then the passage through the turnstile is monitored by these, um, these sensors all the way through the lane here. Another option here would be um, a swing barrier. And we've got a short video to, to watch here. Um, there should be some sound alongside this video. So just to, to make you aware of that. And um, hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll hear that in just a moment. This is the Glassgate 150. And as you can see, it's got a swing barrier, which is hinged at one side and then the wing opens away from you to, to allow, uh, allow entry. And then you can see and hear that there are various visual and audible alerts and the sound level can be adjusted. And passage through the barrier can be enabled in either direction. And then a third option here to look at is the optical barrier. So this um, is where there's no actual physical barrier in place. There's no arms or wings um, to impede access. It's purely optical. So the sensors are built into the each pedestal that you can see. And this is where you can make a decision between whether you need absolute security or actually an alert based system. So um, here with the optical barrier, sensors still track uh, entry and exit through the through, through the uh, the entry barrier and this is recorded so so links to sentry um, and um, alerts are also available so should somebody um, pass through without having um, author authenticated themselves then, then there will still be alert and likewise for tailgating as i say there are some other barrier types but uh, um, that are available these are the three that we've chosen to take a look at briefly there Something else to think about when um, designing your, your, your lane system would be how do people exit the building in an emergency? Um, do the entry barriers or entry and exit barriers need to be linked to the fire alarm um, system? This is almost always the case, but if you, for instance, have some high value items within your building, then perhaps you may choose uh, to offer emergency egress in a different manner. Perhaps the, the, the entry barriers need to be secured uh, differently. Clearly throughput capacity needs to be considered. How many people are you looking to allow entry to your building or need to have entry or exit to your building at any one time throughout the day? We'll take a look at this in a bit more detail shortly. And then in terms of designing your, your lane system, clearly the uh, floor space that is available to you dictates uh, to some degree exactly how many barriers or how many lanes you can fit into, fit into that area. So when designing the lanes, uh, we also need to consider legislation. Um, most obviously or most prevalent here is accessibility legislation. So things have changed over the past few years from a design point of view here. So um, previously it might have been acceptable to have um, a separate pass gate off to one side that, that was primarily for users who, who needed um, assistance or, or accessibility. Whereas now the, um, the design focus really is to, to incorporate accessibility compliant widths of lane into the, um, the, the same lane layout as a standard width so you can hear or you can see here an option is to 
potentially add some accessibility, accessibility compliant width lanes at either end of the installation, and then the central lanes here are, are standard width. But all the, the accessibility lanes are therefore also then available to be used by, by anybody. And so it also um, helps to increase capacity of, of your lanes. And a second option would be potentially if you have the space and the space allows for it to have every single lane as, a, as an accessibility width compliant option. And a further option here is, do you need extra wide lanes? So for instance, um, we've, we've seen um, uptake of this in um, sports venues where sports wheelchairs are, are wider than standard width wheelchair. So we need an extra wider lane still. So there are options there as well. What is your approach or your philosophy to entry and exit? Are you planning to only have entry control and it's a free exit? in which case we'd call this an in-system, or do you wish to have exit controls as well? So it would be an in-out system. And there's, there's pros and cons to, to both. The main benefit of an entrance and, uh, of an in-out system would be the data that's then available to you in terms of um, total occupancy and usage of the building um, throughout the day. Do all your barriers want to be in a single line? So entry and exit is in, in one single line here, or perhaps would the entry and exit be separated? So here in the example, you can see there's some glass infill separating the entrance and exit. This could obviously be a reception desk, or um, further still, does the exit now need to be in a completely different area? So um, with, with COVID and uh, change of use of buildings, we, we, we've seen a bit of an upturn or, or take of putting the exit in a completely different area to enable a one-way system operation throughout the building. How many lanes do you need? Again, this is linked to visitor throughput. Um, do you have peak periods and how are you gonna manage that capacity and minimize queuing? Um, so you can look at this, do you um, have, for instance, a morning rush um, on the way in? Is there then a rush on the way out at lunchtime? End of lunch, is there suddenly a peak for people to get back in? And similarly, at the end of the day, is, is there a, a rush for people leaving? Or is it more spread out through the day? Do you have a, a, a steady flow of people arriving and leaving throughout the day? Or do you have smaller spikes throughout the day, perhaps at lecture change uh, changeovers or class changeovers, um, where people are, are arriving and leaving in a consolidated period of time um, throughout the day? Or is it a combination of all three of these? And that might be a combination throughout the throughout the week or even throughout the year at different different times, maybe through holidays are, are different to, to how they are through through term time. And this might all be uh, anecdotal. You might just have a feeling for how your, your entrance is used and your building is used, or it might be uh, evidence-based. So using Sentry, you can track the statistics and the ebb and flow of the usage of your, your building entrance. And this can then feed into obviously how many lanes are required but also the makeup of those lanes. So do they need to be single direction? So is the entrance only an entrance? Does it allow only people to enter through the building or is it or is it perhaps bi-directional so you could have a single lane that can allow entry or exit in either direction and then there's further options here so does it need to link to lane control so for example in this layout here um, the central lanes as dictated by the arrows here can be entry or exit and they're configured within sentry so in the morning for instance on the way in the, uh, when you would expect um, entry traffic to be higher, the lanes are configured to be entry only. So you have a majority of entry lanes. And then similarly, at the end of the day, when you would expect exit traffic to be higher, the lanes are switched around and you have more exit lanes. Some other things to think about. As mentioned, the, the standard finish of the barriers is, is glass and stainless steel, a, a brushed stainless steel finish. Um, this might not be appropriate for your particular building. Are special materials required? For instance, is your building uh, historic or, or listed? So for instance, or, or for example, perhaps a, a bronze finish that to the, to the might be required. Um, or is there a particular design element that your architect or, or design team are keen on? For instance, we've just completed a project in, in Ireland 
where the uh, use of the corporate colours was was um, heavily featured throughout the building and, and the barriers themselves and the book security indeed are actually finished in a, uh, a sort of burgundy red colour um, to match the corporate colours of, of the university. How are the barriers going to be installed? So we've got a couple of options here. Um, we have the direct option here. So as you can see, the barriers are installed directly to the, the finished floor and the, uh, any cabling for the barriers is, is channeled into the floor and, uh, and fed up from the underneath of the barrier. So this uh, creates a, a lovely seamless finish to the installation, but it does uh, require um, some intensive civil works to, to channel the floor out and to, to route cables through. So it, it can be a little bit more disruptive. A second option then is the base plate option. So you can see here that the barriers are installed to a custom base plate and this actually fits or is installed directly on top of the, uh, the finished floor. So there's no need to channel the floor, there's no drilling to the floor and there's no damage to the floor. So this might be appropriate um, for, for instance uh, where the uh, floor is of historical value or it might um, also be of use where you have underfloor heating or induction loops where either you're not entirely sure where they are or the cost is prohibitive for, for drilling in that area so you want to avoid that. The other benefit of this as well is that potentially you could very easily move the barriers as there's no damage to the floor there'd be no making good and you might want to, to, to place the barriers in an alternative location at, at some point. You need to think about your surroundings. What else is in the area of the barriers? For instance, is, is there a reception desk or a customer help point um, easily available? Is it within line of sight of the barriers? Or um, if it's not, how would somebody who, who's perhaps struggling um, to gain entry or needs some assistance, how would they get help? Do you need an intercom system for them to be able to speak to, uh, speak to somebody? Is there space before um, your visitors actually get to the barriers? Is there space for circulation? Is there space for a wheelchair user to um, change their mind about entering and, and turn and, and exit the building? Your books of security, obviously we're, we're talking primarily here about, about libraries and, and access control in libraries. Um, book security is, is prevalent. Do the barriers need to, to link to the book security? So for instance, when um, an, an item that's not been or that is still secured passes through the book security system does the access control barrier need to lock to prevent access is the installation of barriers a good opportunity to perhaps modernize your book security um, and, and, to, and to make some changes there Does the, uh, once you've settled on the amount of lanes required and, and, and the barrier model, does this fill completely the, this, the space that, that you have available? Or do you need some form of infill to close off the gap either side to ensure that the system can't be bypassed? This could be something as simple as potentially a, a, a bookshelf that's, or, uh, that's moved to, to, to fill the space, or it could be some, um, some glass and stainless steel inf infill um, that's specifically designed to, to match the, um, the finish of the barriers that, that you've invested in. Staff overrides, again, linking to your surroundings and where the reception desk is. Um, how are you potentially going to allow entry or afford entry to people who either don't have a card to visitors perhaps um, deliveries and um, do you have staff who are uh, generally desk based so you can have a fixed override console at that point or are your staff more mobile and, and therefore you might need a, a wire free RF um, remote key fob to, to allow uh, entry to those people without cards or visitors or deliveries. Do you need to consider other access solutions for other areas of your building? So do you have other doors that, that, that need to be uh, secured, but, allow, uh, but access is still allowed through, perhaps um, some external doors for staff or other doors internal to the building? You might have some areas that, that are limited to, to, to certain cohorts of students. And do you have other access solutions that need to be thought about too? So for instance, um, we've, we've integrated with, with lift access at, at a, a number of buildings where, so where your library is, is, is split over several floors. For instance, some of those floors may not 
be accessible to, to students. So the, the lift has a card reader on there to authenticate staff and, and only then can they access that floor. So at this point, I'll hand back over to Kevin, who will, will take a bit of a zoom out and, and, and look at some other of the aspects of the, the system there. Thank you, Barney. So yes, and the first thing we're going to look at, or uh, well, the next thing we're going to look at is the user journey. Uh, so the access control barrier user, uh, what is their experience? What we want is, it for, uh, is for it to be uh, effective, uh, intuitive uh, and fast. And one of the ways we can start to, to try and influence that and improve that is, is to provide a little bit of, of patron interaction from the barriers. And our starting point for that is some, some LED indication. So we can, we can obviously use red and green, the international colors of, of choice for, for, for good and bad, uh, but there's a limit to what uh, an LED can, uh, can convey. So ideally what you want to try and do is, is present some uh, more detailed images and, and graphics and that type of thing. We have a graphics display unit, which, which triple reinforces uh, messages to the user to make sure that they are doing the right thing at the time and, and to instruct them on what they've got to do next. So uh, that reinforcement comes in, in wording. So obviously please scan card, uh, please enter, <coughs> excuse me, uh, <coughs> please go away, that type of thing. Uh, we also have colors. So again, we're making use of, of red and green, but that doesn't work for, for everybody, obviously. And when we reinforce that with, with icons, so we have a, a red cross, for example, if you're not allowed through, uh, a green arrow, for example, if you are allowed through. Uh, obviously, the ultimate form of feedback uh, from a barrier is going to be the barrier opening uh, so that the person can just walk through. And we are somewhat less concerned about those people who are, who are able to go through. We are uh, more concerned with those people who, who are either unauthorized for whatever reason, or indeed they haven't got as far as, as authenticating themselves yet because they're not entirely sure what it is they have to do. Those are the people that are going to affect our, our capacity of our system. And they're the people we need to try and, and, and convey feedback to. So what about that method of uh, authentication? So there are a, a variety of, of, of fundamental choices. We have almost uh, almost entirely installed uh, ID card based or authentication access control. So I will mention one or two others before we move on right at the end. But if we focus on, on ID card uh, for the time being, what you want your access control system to do, obviously, is to be compatible with your existing ID cards, assuming that you've already got uh, institution ID cards in, in circulation. <clears throat> so those ID cards will have uh, a technology on uh, or technologies on, they'll be barcode or uh, contactless or, or magstripe or, or others. And you want your access control system to be choosing the optimum technology on that card to, to use. <clears throat> and that optimum is going to be something that's responsive, uh, something that's, that's easy for the user to use, something that's accurate, of course, it needs to correctly identify uh, the person in front of them, uh, and something that is secure, since the, the whole point of the system is, is a security system. Uh, what scores very highly at the moment is, of course, contactless, and, and the majority of our installations these days are, are contactless, uh, but, but certainly not entirely. And you may have a, a legacy of, uh, of ID cards in, in circulation. You may have uh, some historical ID cards, which are different, that the access control system needs to be compatible with. So you may actually have a need to have more than one reader on, on the uh, barrier. And you may have to accommodate associate institutions. So uh, the college down the road or the university down the road, uh, or the nursing school or something like that. And, and they will have their own ID cards, which perhaps the access control system needs to be compliant with. So you just might need to have a dual or, or multiple readers on the barrier. We developed, <coughs> oh, I do apologize. We developed a, um, a dual reader uh, that sits in a single scan window. 
And this dual reader contains a barcode reader and a proximity reader uh, scanning at the same point. So the visitor does not need to know what type of card they've got. They don't need to know what type of technology is on their card. And they certainly don't need to choose between a couple of readers that, that might be sat on, on the barrier. All they do is they present their card over a single scan window and whichever uh, card reader detects their technology first is, is just away and running. Now, one of the issues we have if we're going to adopt uh, an ID card based uh, access control system is we're going to have visitors turn up without ID cards. And so you have to have a policy uh, and a process perhaps to, to deal with that. Now we do have institutions we're, we're well aware who have a, a, a no card, no entry policy. Uh, that's certainly one policy and it's certainly nice and simple. But we have plenty of institutions who are uh, perhaps more forgiving. Uh, and that then might involve uh, such a visitor reporting to uh, an inquiry desk, uh, perhaps um, proving who they are. Uh, and be given either a temporary pass or, or being buzzed through the, uh, the lane. That's not a great experience. The, the person may well find themselves queuing in the first place. Um, it's not a great experience to have to prove who you are to someone you don't know. Um, and of course, if there's quite a few of these uh, transactions taking place, then, then it could be uh, heavy on, on your staff resource. Uh, given that you've adopted an access control system in order to perhaps to free up some, some security staff time in the first place. So can technology help you with, with cardless visitors? Well, for example, we have a, a self-service kiosk uh, where a user can authenticate themselves using the login and password. So they're, they're, they're institutionally, uh, the kiosk will do some checks that the person's allowed in. Um, and if so, we'll, we'll issue a, a temporary pass that the person can just use. So that should circumvent the queues, uh, certainly circumvents uh, staff time and, and so on. But possibly you don't even need to, to report to a kiosk. Um, and there are a few um, instances now where our customers are using smartphone apps, uh, where the app uh, can do a couple of things. It could show a barcode, for example, and that barcode can then be read by the barcode reader on the turnstile. Um, those of you with, with older installations might find your barcode readers uh, are not compatible with phone screens. And if that's the case, there is a, an upgrade path available for, for that barcode reader. Uh, other phone apps can use potentially uh, a wireless technology on the phone like, like NFC. Uh, and you could have an NFC compliant uh, reader in the cabinet and the user can authenticate themselves that way. Uh, our, uh, we have a smartphone app uh, called uh, Juno Buddy. It currently uses a barcode and uh, we have a plan to uh, adopt uh, a wireless technology, probably NFC, uh, on the development plan. So, so that solution will be available soon. Kevin, while you're on um, card readers, we have a question from Mark Butterworth. Can the card reader read QR codes? The newer ones can. Um, so it depends which, which installation you've got, and we can obviously check that for any particular customer. Um, but all the, uh, all the recent barcode readers from the last couple of years can read phone screens. If they can read a phone screen, they can read a QR code. So, um, Yes, so, so that's ID cards. And, um, and as, as I said earlier, there are some alternative options. Uh, and uh, one of those is just a pin pad, for example, or, or something uh, along those lines. Uh, you have to know the pin in order to proceed any further. Um, perfectly all right, we have one of those in the office on, on a door in the office here. Um, and at the other end of the scale, uh, there's biometric. We are uh, perfectly able and capable of, of fitting um, a variety of biometric devices onto our, our turnstile lanes uh, in order to control them. Um, as of yet, we haven't actually deployed any, um, and that is perhaps a reflection of the uh, perhaps the, the level of security and and, and the, the the market and the sector that, that we currently serve. There are clearly biometric access control systems in place, 
um, it's not something that that we particularly adopted and there are there are complexities with it um, and and one of those complexities perhaps is is how that is actually perceived by by access control system users as well in in, in the first instance and just to um close out uh, the content here with a few other um, points about sort of system level considerations. Uh, and first of all, as we've already covered uh, in a few places, you're, you are going to have some backend software. So you've got a line of barriers. The authentication is being handled by an access control system and then probably a, a database along with it. And of course, the only product you need to consider is, is Sentry. And that access control system is, is undertaking authentication on, on every single visit attempt. And unless you are manually entering every uh, member record into the access control system itself in the first instance, then there's probably a link between the access control software and a host system. So this could be a staff record system or a student record system. And, and in many cases with our customers, of course, uh, a library management system. And that system will return a confirmation as to whether the record exists or not, for example, but it, it typically returns additional information as well. So it can return profile information about, about the visitor. And that profile information can lead us to apply different rules, for example, for different users. So is, is this type of user allowed through this type of barrier? So for example, is, is, a, is an undergraduate allowed through the, into the postgraduate room and that type of thing? Uh, are users allowed through the barrier at this time of day uh, or on this day of the week, that, that type of rule. And the profile information that we get back from the LMS can also feed into our statistics and our reports so that we are uh, not just giving you information about total usage, but we're giving you information about types of user, types of visitor, and, and the different ways in which they are, they are using the facility. And we also have other systems that we can link to. So, so fire alarm is, is not really an option. Fire alarm is, is pretty much a given. Uh, Barney mentioned emergency egress. You can certainly link your fire alarm into to your exit barriers and quite often your entrance barriers as well. Um, and that is, as I say, pretty much a, a given um, for, for a long time now. You could also link into CCTV. So if there are cameras in the area, uh, you can, we can provide, well, our system can provide uh, a stimulus to the CCTV to start recording. So this could be something, could be a refusal, for example, at the barrier. Uh, but perhaps more likely it might be a, a more serious event, such as a, a tailgating event or perhaps misuse of, of the barrier as well. That could all feed into CCTV to, to start recording. And there are other options as well in terms of, of what we could integrate with. So, for example, if the access control system knows how many people or if there are people in a particular room, then perhaps it can control lighting and, and heating and, and that type of thing as well. And finally, and, um, and uh, somewhat topically, uh, pre-booking of visits, integrating that into access control. So obviously this is something that that we've seen uh, quite a bit of in, re in recent months, where uh, library capacity has diminished perhaps because desks are, are now roped off or perhaps just, just maximum occupancy has, has been downsized by, by our customers. Uh, demand is still there. So rather than turning students away at the door uh, because you're full, and indeed to, to provide staff and, and management with, with a little bit of information about how many people are, are going to be there on any day, then, then students have to pre-book either, either that they're visiting the library or even that they're actually pre-booking a, a specific desk in the library. So once that's taking place and once pre-booking is taking place and is a requisite to, to getting in, one of the things you might have to find yourself doing is staffing the entrance area in order to check that, that your students have all got pre-bookings and uh, turning them away. <coughs> so the ideal would be to get your access control system to be doing that for you, to be checking on top of all the other things, like is the person normally allowed in, do they have a pre-booking? <coughs> and this is the, uh, the Juno 2020 development that we undertook um, and rolled out to, to a number of sites 
uh, last year. It does exactly that and allows allows pre-booking uh, and allows that to be automatically checked by, by the barriers so you don't have to staff the area. And that brings us to the end of the presentation material. And it takes us on to uh, Q&A. So, um, Daisy, I don't know if you've got any any questions already lined up. Um, by all means, start typing further questions, and we'll uh, we'll hang around and, and answer any uh, questions that you might have. Yes. So we have a question from Chris Allen. Um, going back to the biometrics, are there any restrictions with storing biometric data that you're aware of? How would this be achieved on a system with biometric security? It's it's a bit of a minefield, and it's probably a webinar in its own right. Um, but there, there are a couple of, of um, comments to make right up front. One of them is that um, the storage of data is often um, not reverse engineerable. So, for example, if you take a fingerprint biometric, the fingerprints are not stored. Nobody could could hack a system, find a fingerprint, and then frame somebody for um, for a crime or anything like that. What it does is it stores uh, just some key data about some key cast characteristics of, of that. And, and that's how most biometrics would work as well. So in terms of personal data, there, there is that point. But of course, it is still subject to, to all, all the rules and regulations about uh, data protection. Um, the, the fact would be that if, you've, if you feel that you need biometric uh, security, if you feel that's a business requirement, then, then you are entitled to, to record and, and, and to run such a system. But you obviously have to have those controls in place. To do, I hope that helps. Further to that, Kevin, I think as well worth saying that the biometric data is generally stored or normally stored within its own biometric data base. So um, the, uh, the system authenticates itself against that, so the data is, is stored securely and normally provided by the biometric reader itself. Um, but we're more than happy to talk to you in, in, in more detail about this uh, following on, if, if, if that's of interest. Um, Mark Butterworth's asked, our university uses Bluepoint for visitors for forgotten cards, which gives them a QR code. Could this be compatible? Uh, in short, I think the answer is, is probably yes. Um, we would uh, clearly need to, to check exactly how we could authenticate against the Bluepoint system. I mean, we could certainly read the QR code, but it's just then about how um, Sentry uh, obviously checks that it's a, it's a valid QR code, whether that data is brought across into the Sentry system or if we need to, to, uh, to, to um, authenticate against Bluepoint. So, um, yeah, some, something for, we can certainly look at again. Um, um, and happy to talk to you in more detail, Mark, about that. Um, we have a question from Martin Randon. Uh, I have a question about the statistics of the lane control. Are they in real time? Is it possible to use the, an app to confirm my reservation and open the turnstile? Uh, there's a few questions in there. So lane control, uh, yes. The, the, there are a couple of options, actually. You can set up scheduled uh, lane control effectively, turning lanes uh, off and on uh, as per a, a weekly um, timetable. But the, um, the simple lane control option in the uh, Sentry client application allows you to instantly change the lane. So, you, so you, for example, you might look out and see there's a little bit of a queue and you could instantly open up another lane. Um, what was the, the last part of the question, Daisy? Uh, yes, yeah, so that comes in real time. Is it possible to use an app to confirm my reservation and open the term star? The, the booking app, uh, it, it, I think the easy answer is that our access control, our Sentry access control system is compatible with our booking system and our booking system includes a uh, phone app. So, so you can certainly use our phone app to make yourself a booking and get through a turnstile. If you're looking to use another booking system, then actually that, that's just going to require a conversation and, and an investigation. We would be open to, to explore any such options with, with anybody, um, but you are, compliant, you are um, 
sort of stuck in the hands of, of other suppliers as well, being, being equally uh, willing. Um, and there would be a bit of an investigation, a bit of a lead time as well on, on that, but happy to discuss. And um, we've got Leah, who's um, I'm allowing to talk. <laughs> Hi, Leah. I think you're mute, Leah. I probably did that by accident, did I? Sorry. Hi, Leo. How are you doing? Hi, guys. Sorry. I probably pushed something by accident, did I? Oh. You I can hear you now. So you're okay. fine now. How can you? Sorry. I think I pushed something by accident. Oh, oh another question. No problem. <laughs> oh, okay. I did, what did I do? Raise my hand, did I? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> It will. It was good to speak to you anyway. Yeah, good to see you, Ray. Thanks for the presentation. Very good. Oh, thank you. Pleasure. I'll mute myself. <laughs> Have we got any other questions? Uh, let me un un go back to the uh, webcams, actually. It'll be a bit more, a bit more personable. Any other questions? Not at the moment, no. So, um, we can hang around for a few seconds, see if there's any more questions going to get going to come in. And just to mention that uh, a, a couple of things, we are um, in the midst of creating some some videos, some short videos, and, and these will be uh, FAQ type uh, subjects uh, where people can post questions on the website, and, and we might just answer them, or we might actually create a video um, link. So it might be a, an aspect of functionality or. In, in the product or, or anything like that. So do look out for that. We'll, we'll send you details, uh, but hopefully we can get some, some questions coming in from you on that. Um, we're also looking at the possibility of running an actual live Century user group. Uh, again, we haven't run one for uh, a couple of years um, and we're considering the possibility of doing that at the end of this year, if we're allowed. And also if there's the, the level of interest so do look out for a questionnaire, which I think might go out tomorrow. Um, but we're after your thoughts on, on whether you would um, whether you'd be interested and uh, and willing and able to to attend uh, an actual live user group. Got a Any... couple of questions come in, Kevin. Yes. Um, Dennis Wilson, is the retracting barrier better for wheelchairs? Hi, Denise. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily quite as um, sort of cut and dry as that actually um, sort of retracting barriers and, and the swing barriers with uh, you know the, the, the benefits of the new design that we talked about with the sensors built in they're, they're both fantastic for for wheelchair users and and, and, and managing those and it's much improved um, compared to um, you know the old style swing barrier with, without any sensors built in Uh, I'm interested in a link to CCTV. Is that complicated to add on, please? That's Wumi. Oh, hi, Wumi. Um, probably the um, the first question might be: Have we got enough signal? If it's an existing installation, have we got the right signal cabling coming out from the barrier position? Uh, it's a little bit easier to implement that with a, with a new installation because you can put that all in with, with your cabling um, and in terms of complexity it's just a question of uh, then getting the, the signals it's all done by signal it's all done uh, away from software um, so it's a question of getting those signals into the CCTV system and, and getting us talking to your CCTV uh, maintainer. And uh, Wimmy's also asked uh, could I please find out if this new swing barrier is currently available and what the lead time for delivery is? Yes, um, yes, they're currently available. Um, they've been uh, an existing product for uh, some time. Uh, we have a variety of, of, of swing barriers as well, actually. So they, they, again, even within swing barriers, there are, there are pros and cons of, of a few, of a small number of different models. They're all uh, currently available. They're all available in a showroom as well, by the way, uh, if anyone wants to, to come and have a look at them. Uh, they can see and, and actually try them. And the lead time is um, some, of the, um, some of the more common 
products are on a shorter lead time because they're, they are built ahead of order. But most products are built to order on a lead time of about 10 weeks. And we've got a question from Samantha Drennan. Does the brush steel impact on the book security barriers? And if so, what is the best distance between the two? Yeah, hi, Samantha. Um, so the the steel can impact on book security depending on the security type. So if it's electromagnetic that's in use, then then yes, there can be an impact. So we'd recommend um, a distance of about 600 millimetres between the two systems. Um, if it's RFID, the, the technology that's in use for the uh, for the book security, they can be much closer together, and, and there shouldn't be there shouldn't be any impact uh, between the two. That's it again for the moment. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I think that that probably is it on on questions. By all means, post post a, a remaining question for you through in the last few seconds. But uh, it's probably time to, to say thank you very much um, for attending this morning. I hope it was useful. I hope it was interesting to you. And uh, do look out for uh, the upcoming events that, that we're going to host. So uh, thank you very much. Have, have a good day.